Uh, welcome everybody to Sacred Stories. Uh, I thought it was going to take a lot longer for everybody to sit down and get settled, uh, but here we are. Uh, so to start things off, um, I'd like to invite Joel Moffat up to the stage. Joel, oh, and yours. Good evening, friends and family. Uh, welcome to the Cap Nap reception honoring the tribes who received America the Beautiful Challenge grants. Yeah. I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage um, Nesper singers uh, Jake Whitebloom, Lee Mitchell. Uh, they're they're going to open us up with the uh, with the with the blessing song, and uh, and uh, they, they're they're from back from uh, Nespers uh, Nespers country. Just flew out yesterday, come out to help bless us. Um, Nespers is one of the fourteen tribes to receive America the Beautiful Challenge grant um, to get our salmon uh, over a dam into Wallawa Lake. Uh, so it's something that's really important to us. I'd like to hand over to the floor uh, to these drummers. Good. <clears throat> okay, I will be uh, thankful today that we can be here and uh, acknowledge all the council members here from the different tribes. And uh, our tribe's pretty excited about the uh, endeavors that uh, we want to go for with our Kobo. Um, the Wallawa Lake is pretty important to us as uh, that's first people, that's our homeland, our original homeland. And um, just the other day, one of my uh, my colleagues, he, he drove over to Wallawa to look at some of the land that uh, we could use that could possibly be available for purchase to help us in this effort of this uh, coho restoration. So we're thankful that way because uh, all these years later, we're, we're getting back into the Wallawas and our great chief Joseph, he didn't get to make it back. He didn't get to get back to the Wallawas, but to this day, now present day, we're getting back the Nespers tribe and um, our leaders, they know that. And uh, I'm thankful for that. And this song we're gonna sing comes from the treaty of 1855. That was sung during the treaty council. And so um, we just wanna remember our ancestors because they thought of us to get us this far and remember them and honor them and thank all of you. Thank all the people that have made it possible for our people to be here to where we are today. That's the out, yeah. And uh, our flag song is equivalent. It's just as powerful and just as strong as uh, the national anthems that our people sing. These songs have been around since time and memorial. So if you can all stand, that'd be great. We're going to sing this song, and my brother's going to sing the chief song after that. Let's see how, yeah. <laughs> Hey! 
small round of applause for Jake and Lee. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Sacred Stories. My name is Angelo Villa Gomez, and I am Chamorro from the beautiful island of Saipan. She's my cousin. Uh, on behalf of the Center for American Progress, Native Americans in Philanthropy, and the Biodiversity Funders Group, I'm so glad you could join us today for this special occasion. We are here to celebrate and honor the stories of our ancestors, our cultures, and our lands, stories that connect us to each other and to the earth. But before we start, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge some of the, the leaders who have joined us today, um, Assistant Deputy Secretary uh, Sarah Greenberger, Governor J. Michael Shavaria, Council Member Quincy Ellenwood, Council Member Jeremy Takala, down, I'm sorry. Uh, Council Member Jeremy Takala, uh, Tracy Connard Goodluck, Rachel Brown, uh, NAP Board Member Teresa Sheldon, uh, President Alex Anna Salmon, and Chief Ann Richardson. Chief, is Ann Richards? Hey, what's going on? I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> All right, well, we are here to acknowledge and support the efforts of indigenous-led conservation, which is the most effective and equitable way to safeguard habitat, reverse wildlife loss, and reduce climate change. Indigenous-led conservation is not a new concept. Many of our communities have cared for our territories and waters in a sustainable way for millennia. But the approach has recently found increased support through several initiatives of the Biden administration, and of course, the many people here in this room. The America the Beautiful Initiative is a national call to action to work collaboratively to address climate change, improve access to nature for all Americans, and conserve and restore 30% of US lands and waters by 2030. The initiative recognizes that conservation is not only about protecting nature, but also about enhancing quality of life for people. That's why it makes the sovereignty and rights of tribal nations a core part of its vision. The America the Beautiful Initiative also supports another historic commitment by President Biden, the Justice 40 Initiative, which aims to ensure that 40% of the overall benefits of climate, 
clean energy, affordable housing, clean water, and other inv investments go to disadvantaged communities. The Justice 40 initiative is a whole of government effort to confront and address decades of underinvestment in communities most impacted by climate change, pollution, and environmental hazards. These initiatives are examples of how we can work together across sectors, cultures, and geographies to create a more just and sustainable future for ourselves and the generations to come. They are also examples of how we can learn from indigenous wisdom and leadership in caring for our common home. Thank you for being here today. I hope you enjoy listening to these sacred stories as much as I hope to listen to them. And I hope you feel inspired and take action in your own way to protect our present, our precious planet. Now I'd like to invite uh, Eric Stegman, our event co-host and executive director of Native Americans of Philanthropy up to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening. Um, I first wanna uh, thank our, our singers for opening us with such a beautiful blessing. It's always important to start in, in such a good way, especially for something like this that we're gonna be celebrating. I'm really excited that we have so many of our partners, our tribal leaders in town with us. Um, that in and of itself is a blessing as well. Um, I'm Eric, I'm, I'm the CEO here at Native Americans in Philanthropy and just want to thank our, our co-hosts and partners here at the Center for American Progress. I actually used to work here back in the 2010 era, um, but also our wonderful partners at the Biodiversity Funders Group. This is a unique partnership between philanthropy and nonprofits that are working to really bring together policy philanthropy to support our tribal leaders with our government partners. And I think you're gonna see um, some of the results of this kind of cross-sector collaboration this evening. If we're ever going to address this biodiversity and climate crisis, tribes must be in the lead in that process. And that's what you're gonna hear this evening. Um, Part of the America the Beautiful initi initiative was the America the Beautiful Challenge, which was administered by the, uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, one of our other close partners in this, in this um, excellent initiative. Uh, we were able to work very closely with our tribal partners to support uh, getting the word out there about this funding opportunity. We were also able to work with our partners through the Biodiversity Funders Group Network, many of the funders who are actually here in the room to help guarantee the non-federal match for all tribal applicants to that funding pool. And in the first round, a third of the, the funds that were awarded were awarded to tribes, which is an amazing accomplishment. And we have two more funding rounds to come. So we know exactly what we're gonna do. We, they, uh, the uh, National Fish and Wildlife Announcement, uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation just announced the next round of that funding, and we're looking forward to trying to get at least another third of those uh, tribes funded uh, through that round. Um, we're here to celebrate and recognize the power of indigenous ecological knowledge uh, and the importance indigenous-led conservation and sovereign tribal nations play in doing this work. Tribes bring unique legal and political power to the table, cultural knowledge and understanding, and so much more, and you're going to hear more about that this evening. I wanna go ahead and ask our speakers to go ahead and start taking their seat. And um, and then I'm gonna just acknowledge a few of the other projects that we have in the room. Please go ahead, take your seats. Um, we've got several um, partners in the uh, room who were actually funded through the America the Beautiful Challenge. We have uh, Jillian Walm, are you here? Yes, wonderful. Um, who's uh, Sechangu Lakota and uh, from the Rosebud tribe. And that project is a wetlands uh, restoration and nature-based community engagement. Uh, program, which is a, an ecological inventory assessment informed by wildlife habitat priorities and culturally relevant food and medicine needs that incorporates traditional ecological knowledge for their grassland site. Um, so please uh, do connect um, with Jillian afterwards. And then we also have uh, President uh, uh, Alexana Salmon. Are you here as well? Yes, in the back there, um, who's from Igiagic. I hope I got that close to correct. Um, which is the uh, village council building capacity for indigenous led community environmental monitoring in Southeast Alaska, where six rural indigenous communities in the Lake Iliyama region um, are coming together to assist with climate resilience and adapt adaptation planning efforts. So we've got several partners in the, in the room this evening, but I'm gonna actually go ahead and switch over here to start our conversation with our other partners.
what the organizers told me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all right. Well, we're really honored to have um, some speakers here who are going to really share what this work looks like on the ground in our communities. And I first want to introduce Jeremy Takala, who's a councilman from the Yakima Nation. And can you tell us a little bit about the kind of work that you're doing through the America the Beautiful Challenge and, and what tribal uh, conservation looks like from your community standpoint? What are some of your, what's your vision for this work in your community? Okay, can I introduce myself real quick? Yes. So, Nick Klawet, Ina Wanisha, Bokhanisha, Shepatim, Jeremy, Takala, Huapa Miana, Wichi, Klawetpa, Washna Stawa, Kinchi Wanapa, Mitpa, Band, Wayam, Pawanpa, um, the Yakima Nation. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name, my my uh, Indian name is Bokhanisha. Uh, my English name is Jeremy Takala. I am um, from the, the Big River people of the Columbia River. Um, I, I serve on the Yakima Nation Tribal Council. There's 14 councilmen, and I'm one of the, the youngest. <laughs> and um, I actually came from the fisheries program prior before getting elected onto Tribal Council. Um, for us at Yakima Nation, and you know, as well as the, the brothers here from Nimipu, you know, we have uh, ongoing work with the four treaty tribes that consist of the Warm Springs, the Umatilla, the Nez Perce, and the Yakima Nation. Uh, we are a USB Oregon tribe. Um, you know, we have quarterly meetings working with the co-managers uh, when it comes to um, the the salmon and restoration work that occurs in the region. Uh, for Yakima Nation, we have roughly over 200 full-time seasonal employees with our, our fisheries program. Uh, we do a lot of habitat or restoration projects, such as what we utilize uh, this, the America the Beautiful grant that was uh, received. And so we have we have continuously had habitat restoration projects throughout the Klemmer River Basin, up in the upper Klemmer River to the middle, and to even in the lower tributaries that flow into the Klemmer River. Uh, we've had um, sockeye reintroduction to where sockeye wasn't um, really, you know, they're really low, low numbers. So our former leadership at the time felt that we need to do something and change because we did not want to see an extinction of sockeye. And so today that program is is successful, but we are running into issues because, you know, climate change that is, we're all impacted by that. And so part of our habitat restoration um, projects utilizing the funds with, you know, partners, whether it be in a region or, um, you know, nationally is creating these projects that will have benefits to the anadromous fish resident and the the smolts because it creates um, a place for them for cover, shade, and not only that, to actually have a pool that they can actually, you know, take cover, especially during summertime. We're our our seated lands consists about a third of the state of Washington, and so we're on the east side of the Cascade Range. So the rainfall is very, you know, it's it's dwindling every year. So we don't have much as much snowpack as we used to. So in preparation, you know, we have a um, a salmon strategy plan that's been adopted through our council that our fishery staff has worked closely. It's funny to say this, though, I really feel like it's outdated because continuously we're trying to up, keep up, you know, with the ever-changing climate. So um, that's just one one piece. Uh, we we have a lamprey project. We have sturgeon project. Uh, most recently, we received additional funds to actually put forth um, a residential fish study program like trout, whitefish, bridge lip sucker, um, the list goes on. So um, I just want to share that much and... Uh, yeah, that's that's what we utilize our, our funds mainly for. But also, you know, um, I want to mention because our, our people, you know, were historically um, removed, you know, from the Klemmer River. Some some of them, our people still remain year round. But because of the hydro systems that were put into place, you know, it really impacted the salmon runs where we had 17 million plus returning to now we're only about just a million returning now. So you can you can really see, you know, the the impacts of hydro systems. But we are we are working, you know, the, the federal trust responsibility is very important that the core and BPA work with the tribes that are bringing back the salmon. One thing I will point out, though, is it, it's it's always it's very remarkable that the tribes here, they're not responsible for the changes, the progress that was made, you know, through the construction of hydro systems. But yet here we are, the tribes are taking initiative to you know, bring back the salmon, bring back the lamprey, the sturgeon, and, you know, utilize these funds towards those projects. So thank you. 
Thank you so much. And um, we're also really honored to have Governor Chavarria from uh, Santa Clara Pueblo. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about where you come from and, and the kind of work that you're going to be doing with this initiative. Uh, no, we are in Hona Kony, no one be party for Nicky Pinky Connery, Wagger, no one at Tante Kisalona Moo, in Tung Jung Hona Moo, in Capoing Gepe, on any Ginanding Wagger, you'll be arguing with PAK, you'll be arguing with Han if we don't be arguing a corny, and how he unctured a mind, what would he sort of power man in him? Again, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Michael Chavria. I serve as governor for Santa Clara Pueblo. Uh, in my Tewa language, I just asked permission to speak, but also uh, said out of respect and good evening. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you uh, this evening. Uh, I am currently serving my 13th term, uh, one year term as governor for Santa Clara Pueblo. Based upon our constitution written in 1935, we have annual elections held every January 2nd. Uh, so I've been serving my 10th consecutive term from 2014 uh, to present. Uh, previously, I served as our forestry director and also our water quality coordinator. So it's very important uh, to have a holistic approach to landscape level management. Uh, we do have a, a presentation as well, so I, I'll give the introduction. And then myself and Daniel will go ahead and go into our presentation to give you a little bit more insight of our history, but also the uh, potentials with America the Beautiful uh, grant. Again, as a holistic approach, but incorporating traditional ecological knowledge, nature-based solution, engineering with nature. All these are very important concepts that the polos continue to utilize, but the key and the glue is our native language. For us, is Tewa. So that's the glue that holds our traditions, our cultures and values together. So it is very important that we utilize these concepts for co-management, stewardship, but all the opportunities, not only just on our land, but also federal lands, such as the Forest Service, Park Service, BLM, uh, the state lands, which is very critical because they contain our traditional cultural properties, sites of importance, which are place-based. And so once these sacred sites are disturbed, there's no way to mitigate them because you can't replicate them. You can't move them. And so this is what's very important. But we all go back to the power of prayer, asking the creator to guide us, to give us that strength so that we can continue this work and the legacy for our future generations uh, for tomorrow. So I just appreciate the opportunity at this time. Thank you, Michael. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Daniel Denapa, and uh, like uh, Governor Chavarria had mentioned, I am the director of forestry. Um, kind of touch a little bit on on everything that he said as well, and uh, kind of piggyback off of what he's uh, talking about, and and a lot of the the stuff that we're going to be doing, especially with the America the Beautiful grant. You know, we have the opportunity to. Uh, uh, kind of base everything off of what we've done prior to everything and kind of build on that. Um, Santa Clara has had four ponds that um, were actually inundated by uh, sediment and uh, we had 100% fish kill up there and we're looking at trying to get those ponds reopened, uh, reestablishing a, a permanent road and and preserving actually what we have left of forest areas up there. Uh, we had damaged uh, from three previous fires and we'll get a, a little bit more into that, like he had said with the um, presentation that we have uh, going on and you'll be able to see some of those devastating effects. But a lot of everything that we have uh, kind of coincides with everything and, and we have a whole laundry list of uh, of uh, treatments that we're going to be doing along the board, especially with the America the Beautiful grant. But thank you. And did you want to go ahead and go through your presentation? Sure. Sure. Let's we'll see if I can get this technology working here. All right, here we go. So this is, uh, again, the presentation that we've uh, prepared for the America the Beautiful uh, Riparian Corridor Restoration. Uh, so next is... Uh, Kapo or Santa Clara Pueblo. Our table name is Kapo Owinge, which translates to the Valley of the Wild Roses. The history of, of Santa Clara Pueblo, did I go too far? There we go. So the history of Santa Clara Pueblo, the current village of Santa Clara Pueblo is one of the oldest occupied settlements in the United States. Having been in our present location since for about 600 years, 
Prior to our present location, we inhabited the Hamas Mountains of Parito Plateau at our ancestral village of Puje, or Puye Cliffs, which remains a significant uh, landmark for visitors, but also Santa Clara Pueblo. However, like most other tribes in the United States, we lost much of our Aboriginal lands to other governments and settlements. Since inhabiting our current land area, we coexisted with the Spanish crown, the Mexican government, but also the United States government. So what we have here is showing the kids doing the corn dance, but also the deer dance. And so these are the traditional activities, the dances we still utilize today to showing that connection to the landscape, the natural materials and resources, and giving thanks to the animals, but also to the corn uh, after harvesting we also give thanks to them for giving us the subsistence for our people. So our culture uh, is very dependent on our lands. We use our lands for hunting, fishing, gathering food, medicines, and agriculture. But most importantly is our spiritual sanctuary. Again, it's our grocery store, our pharmacy, our clothing, th clothing store, but also important as our biological classroom. So this is very important of that connection of how I mentioned the holistic approach to land level uh, management. And so I invite you all to come visit Santa Clara. We're in Northern New Mexico. Uh, we're about two hours north of Albuquerque, uh, 30 minutes north of Santa Fe. So whenever you're in New Mexico, please come by and visit Santa Clara. But from here, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Daniel so he can go ahead and provide more information on the fires and the activities that's happening. But thank you. Kodawaha. All right, thank you, Governor, for that. And uh, I'll, we'll kind of go here. Let me see if I can get that. Uh, those three fires I was talking about, uh, one of them is the Los Conchas fire, which happened back in 2011. Uh, that had devastating uh, impacts and actually uh, impacted the, the upper watershed of uh, Santa Clara Pueblo. Okay, and uh, just to, to kind of go back on that and, and look at, um, oh, I think I went too far. Uh, we had the Los Conchas fire again, that was back in uh, 2011. And uh, we also had the Sierra Grande fire, which happened in, uh, that was um, back in 2000. So the America the Beautiful grant. Um, we have some project activities. Um, one of that uh, involves conifer thinning. The remaining forests that we have up there, uh, we want to try to preserve as much as possible. So we want to make sure that we're thinning out that portion up there to make it more tolerant and resistant to fire in case we have another devastating fire like that come through again. Uh, we're doing a lot of in-stream restoration. Um, trying to get uh, the stream to meander again. Uh, again, when we talked about the uh, fish kill, we had a lot of sediment move down into the main stem of the Santa Clara Creek. And uh, when that happened, you know, a lot of um, uh, trees, logs, and sediment had moved into there. And it took us quite a while to even uh, get into some of those places because we had to reopen the roads and, and uh, look at other stuff. So uh, we finally, took what we call the a, a top-down approach. Um, because of the erosion that was happening there, uh, and you, everybody knows that the erosion travels uphill, so we got to the top of the mountain and started cutting off that erosion, working down till we finally hit the mainstream of the, the Santa Clara Canyon, and that's where we're gonna start doing our in-stream uh, restoration work. We, uh, we're also looking at riparian tree planting. Uh, we did about 750,000 uh, seedlings planted. Those were all commercial tree species. Uh, now we switched our focus now to the main stem of the, the creek, where we're looking at some of the riparian trees that used to exist there and start putting those back. Um, we're doing a conifer reforestation. Again, uh, a lot of the planting, uh, some of the effects from uh, not only the wildfires, but we're looking at climate change 
and some of those species that are very important to the tribe uh, for preserving for the future because it's a part of their culture and who they are. And a lot of those uh, plants and trees are utilized in the dances. So that's very important to the tribe that try to put that stuff back. Uh, again, looking at some of the wetland restoration, not only planting in those areas, but enhancing them. Uh, we're trying to, to figure out uh, ways we can open those areas up a little bit, um, get some more grasses planted in there, uh, the riparian trees and stuff like that. Um, we're also looking at the expansion and the recreation portion of it. Um, we have uh, also an invasive species eradication program uh, there at, in Santa Clara. Uh, the, the Bosque area, which is the Rio Grande River that runs through the center of, of um, Santa Clara Pueblo, was actually very heavily uh, infested with invasive species. We had a lot of um, uh, what they call Russian olive, Siberian elm. It was uh, basically changed the whole ecosystem down there. Uh, we managed to take and treat about almost 2,000 acres of that area down there and open it back up. Uh, when we found, when we, we look back on that, you know, trying to put back things historically the way they were uh, prior to the invasive species, uh, we started noticing there was a loss of, of habitat um, for, for some of the cottonwood trees there and some of the uh, stuff that used to be harvested uh, a long time, which is asparagus. And you can't find that stuff in there anymore. And it's a big loss. And, you know, uh, the elders there will also tell you, well, you know, we used to always find this stuff at a certain time of year. It can't be found there anymore. But uh, now that we've opened some of those spaces, and we want to continue treating some of that and, and continue because it's it's an ongoing effort. Uh, we still have properties up that uh, abut Santa Clara Pueblo and and uh, they they don't treat those lands. So we have a seed source that comes back onto the tribe and we're consistently battling that. And that's uh, the reason for us um, trying to do some of that invasive species eradication. Uh, we're looking at doing some water development, uh, opening up the ponds again, uh, getting the stream to re-meander. And uh, when I'm, I'm talking about some of the, the ponds, it's not just the, the four ponds in the main stem of the creek there. It's also the outlying ponds that we used to have. They're water catchments. And um, being that we're located in the southwest desert, um, it's it's just that it's a desert. It's not a whole lot of water. And then when we do get water, it's it's a large portion at once. So rather than uh, having it devastate a lot of the the work that we do, we're looking at ways to try to to capture some of that water and save it, and uh, and 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 put that water back where it uh, we can put it to use. And then finally, the community and youth. Uh, educational outreach. Uh, we partnered up with the Santa Fe Indian School uh, to have them come out with uh, helping us to do some of the monitoring, uh, but also planting of the trees. Uh, early on, the, the Tribal Council and Governor had um, spoke to uh, myself and a lot of the staff there uh, concerned about the disconnect of the youth there. Uh, when when all these fires happened up in that canyon area, it was closed to Santa Clara, the people for a long time. And there was a uh, there was a number of youth that actually haven't seen that place prior to the fire. And and that's devastating in the in a fact that it's hard to uh, keep the traditions alive when these people can't actively go up and see some of those places that are dear to the dear to the, the people that are in their hearts, the songs and their traditions. So for us, we're gonna try to bridge that, that gap and um, bring that back and hopefully get those students more involved. And even for ourselves, because we're getting older and uh, we're gonna be retiring one day, we need somebody there that's gonna carry this on and, uh, and carry it forward for us. So it's very important work. Um, the last slide we have there, is just showing our collaborative partnership 
um, a lot of several, uh, a bunch of different um, agencies involved, uh, a lot of NGOs that are involved as well, and even some tribes that have helped out. Um, you have the, the San Manuel uh, Mich Band of Mission Indians that uh, provided us with some funds to buy equipment. That was a big help, especially during the time when we needed it the most to remove some of that sediment and a lot of stuff that was being jumbled up uh, in, in, the, in the creek. But again, this just, uh, just shows a, a, a part of our collaborative uh, partnership. Uh, we still uh, hope to expand that on, on that. And, um, you know, uh, and like Governor said, invite a lot of you back out to see Santa Clara because uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, but when you actually get out there to see it, you'll gain a, a lot more understanding of the, the actual impacts that happened out there. But uh, I'd like to thank uh, everybody for uh, giving us the opportunity at least to share our story with you. So thank you. Thank you so much. And so many so many important points there and just looking at the, the connection between culture and, and how we steward our lands, our young people in my past, my past job, I worked with a national network of our native youth leaders, and they want these kinds of uh, opportunities back home. You know, this is this is the all-inclusive kind of work that's getting done. And um, the other thing I think is so critical is to just see how much tribes are doing, all the different kinds of things that their departments are doing to manage these lands, the kinds of partnerships they're bringing together. Um, before we go to a little Q&A from the audience, um, Councilman Takala, I just wanted to ask you, you know, how do you look at success for this kind of work in your community? You've got, you know, some new resources that are going to be helping you connect your um, ecological and cultural um, uh, pathways back in your community. But what does success look like for all of you? Well, I, thank you for that question. I think success looks like if, you know, we're, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, Sakai reintroduction program. I mean, I, I think laying out the plan or the foundation is, you know, very important. And we're going to see what's, what's, going to work and what is it and where the improvements need to be made. Um, we, uh, we've we created a lot of partnership with the Yakima Basin area and, and the Upper Columbia where we have actually have the stakeholders at the table trying to work on these issues and outreach is very important. We have a lot of irrigation in our area heavily. And so it took years and years and years to finally get the irrigators to understand the importance of salmon in our in the Yakima River and Upper Yakima. And so we we've been working closely with with the irrigators and their understanding with the water use that you know is is needed for the farmers, but also most important needed for the for the salmon. And so we've we work closely together advocating for you know fish passage. Uh, we have a huge project in the uh, Upper Cleelum Reservoir where. We're having a two-year period project that's actually taking place where it has like different levels of the of um, fish access and passage for adult and out migrant smolts. Um, we've 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 always we've always seeked outside you know opportunities such as this one. I mean, it's 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 very important for us as Yakima Nation to create these partnerships because if it wasn't for these partnerships, a lot of these projects would not have been successful if it wasn't for these partners that have been created. And the NGOs, you know, we've got a lot of support in the region, especially, you know, with the pressures of climate change here. And so it's 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 prepping. And and when I when I mentioned earlier about habitat and restoration projects, you know, it's it's creating a restoration or project area, how, as we heard, is is to make it like it was, make it close as possible. And what we're finding out also is we're we're putting forth the effort for fish, but we're also recharging the aquifers because we are, we have we live east of the Cascades, and so within a community that's east of the Res, there's it's a a, a stillhead barren stream but they're also having water shortages. So with these projects, there's long-term benefits, long-term. And so that's the success right there, you know, because we're trying to sit there and understand, okay, it's going to benefit the fish. It's going to benefit the wildlife. It's going to benefit the ecosystem, but how is it going to benefit the people, you know? And that's, that's, that's the success right there is long-term aquifer recharge and the list goes on. Yeah. I really appreciate that because, um, you know, what we're really trying to do with our partners 
uh, in the philanthropic sector and government is to support an indigenous approach to this work, which is really about looking at these life ways again. You know, this you I think just said it beautifully and what what the other benefits are when we can do this work the way that we need to. So really appreciate that. I think we have time for a couple of uh, questions in the audience if you we've got some. Yeah, I just want to say thank oh, you. I think we've got a mic, sorry. And please say your name and affiliation before asking your question. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Burgess. I'm with the um, National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. Just huge thanks to NAPCAP and BFD for hosting this and to congrats to all of the recipients of the um, grant. And we work with state legislators who share a lot of these priorities on invasive species eradication and watershed restoration, riparian restoration. So for any of the panelists, what can state legislators be doing to support your priorities and to make sure that of all the activities that you listed, that you could be doing more of that in a greater capacity? State legislator. I, I could answer that because that's actually going on in my state. <laughs> Um, I think it's very important for tribes to actually stay engaged in some of the bills, you know, that are moving forward. And I think I, I, it's always an issue. And I know the council here usually has issues when we get a turnover in administration, whether it be here in D.C. or, you know, back in our, our states or districts. And the tribes, you know, our vision has never changed. We still carry that story. We still carry that vision of this is how the work should be done. This is what we need to do. But when we have a turnover, we're constantly educating, we're given history, we're given the impacts, the historical trauma that our people have, you know, faced. And I think for for like Nez Perce and the Yakima and the Warm Springs and the Umatilla, the, the state's got to recognize that we are co-managers of the species. You have to understand that we're bringing, yes, we have educated, you know, students that are, you know, tribal members that are now in these, these roles, but also understanding that we are the experts we're bringing traditional ecological knowledge to the table as well and so it's 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 hard for state legislators to kind of understand it because we always have this saying like i don't think the senators should be doing that you know you need to listen to the tribes you know leave it in their hands because they're already doing it you need to put the resources to where what they're they're saying you know because they're the ones that know this work leave it to the experts so co-managers, we we work with the states and they understand that as well. But, you know, I think the tribes have the bigger voice because the sovereigns and, you know, the 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 trust, the trust responsibility that the agencies have. So. Um, and for us in New Mexico, we're fortunate to have the uh, Indian Affairs uh, Department, which is a cabinet level uh, position. And so, again, it's very important to have that uh, liaison with Governor uh, Grisham. And so that's very critical because of the sacred landscapes. And so a lot of these fires started off reservation on state lands, federal lands. So it's important to have a holistic approach, as I mentioned, across the entire landscape. And so currently we do have capital outlay. We have uh, tribal infrastructure funds and water trust board funds that come to the state of New Mexico that we can also utilize for cost matching opportunities to leverage the federal funds, leverage the philanthropic uh, funds or tribal funds to make that money grow three, four, five times. But that's how you leverage. So having that um, connection to the landscape, but also to the state, but also to the federal government is very critical so that we can provide more opportunity uh, for the future. We have time for maybe one more, if we've got another question in the audience. One, one, one in the back there. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Great. Um, I have a question about funding. Right now, you all are in a pretty um, amiable situation with the current administration. So I was wondering whether or not you're concerned about um, your funding for the current projects that you have, or is you know the relationship that you have and the funding that you have insulated from new change and new administration. So are you going to be able to keep doing the same things that you can, that you've initiated right now or with the new administration? You know, how confident are you that you can keep these great uh, partnerships that you have going with the, the federal government going? Anyone want to take it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it is important uh, again to meet uh, with the president, but also with Secretary Holland, 
and all the other agencies within across the federal agency spectrum. So it's very important that we showcase our talents, showcase our skills, our knowledge, that traditional ecological knowledge of how we utilize these resources. So we have to, we built up our internal capacities and capabilities to manage fire, to provide or uh, implement hazardous fuel reduction projects, ecological restoration, water quality. Some of us have water quality standards. So all these things are very important to showcase to the federal government as our trustee in these type of relationships so that we continue to advocate Congress for further appropriations to then uh, add more to the pie. So this week, there are having hearings on the Hill on the House Interior Appropriations Committee. So these are very critical importance that we're out here to testify before Congress. Because if the federal agencies don't get the money, then we don't get the money. So this is what's very important. And we appreciate all of you, part of this philanthropic community, because then we reach out to you to help support us, which is very important. We are a partner. We are a team. So utilizing our expertise, Using our, utilizing our knowledge, our skills, our talents that the Creator has given to each and every one of us is very important. So I, I seek your help to help us. In return, we help you. But this is very critical that we continue to make our trips here to Washington and advocate Congress for additional appropriations, which is very critical because it cannot end. Climate change is real. Fires are real. Insects and disease are real. Three to 5,000 stems per the acre in a forest is an unhealthy forest condition. So all this is very critical, but utilizing the data, utilizing the projects that we implement to showcases that, yes, as tribes, we are capable to do these projects on a multitude, land level restoration and activities, but we got to continue to advocate for additional funds to keep coming. So I'll uh, thank you for that. A good question. Actually, that's why Councilman Ellenwood and I are here too this weekend. So or this week, we we struggle. We struggle with that. I mean, there there's a trust responsibility that the federal government had to the tribes, you know, and that's that's you know that what guarantees you know in our 1855 treaty that you know we have the right the right and um, to fish at all usual and the custom areas. And so, without fish, then there's no treaty. And so, it's very important that we still stay engaged. We have, we call this thing the billion dollar backlog in the region. And Congress is like, yeah, we we support it, but where's the resources? Because we have we have show already projects that are ready to go. They just need the funding. And it, it's a struggle because we're always at status quo. If anything, we're probably actually cut back on some of the fish and wildlife funding that should be going directly to the tribes. And when that situation happens, it feels like a paternalistic feeling because we're getting the fun in, but we have to report what do we lose on it. You can't use it for this, you can't use it for that. You know, so it delays the project and we lose out on some of the relationships that we have within the different communities in, in Washington, you know, and doing the outreach, trying to talk to the community about this is what the Yakima Nation would like to do. To, these are the benefits of this project. But when we are delayed because you know the the the, the bureaucracy, then we never get anywhere. We always, a part of that billion dollar backlog includes hatchery infrastructure, fish passage, even, even for the hydro system upgrades, because those are also failing. And so it's, it's kind of, I don't know, to me, it's kind of, um, I guess in a way, it just seems kind of amusing how the tribes are advocating for some, but yet we're also advocating for infrastructure for some of the hydro system because they, they need improvements, you know, they do for fish passage. Um, Part of that includes habitat restoration. A part of that includes predation because climate change is here. We're having aviary predation. We're having uh, non-native species predation that are just, you know, eating our, our outmigrating smolts out to the ocean. We have sedimentation management that needs the resources because the Columbia River, it functions, it's, it's like a lake, a system of lakes. So you have deltas that are just going, stretching all the way across the Columbia River to where it's just an area for easy prey easy you know and these poor things are just trying to get out to the ocean or they're returning back the past few years we've had issues with adults returning we had sockeye that were trying to return we had sturgeon that were you know they're they're landlocked sturgeon are landlocked in, in the Columbia river 
And these poor things were seeking cold water refuge because why the Columbia River was too hot. And so they're going into these tributaries to where they're not they're not from. Sakai are upper Columbia destined. They're rearing in the just above the Bonneville Dam and the, the Little White uh, the, um, Drano Lake area, Little White Salmon area. And so that's a delayed you know, response. It's not guaranteed once the Clem River cools down that they're going to make it back to their spawning grounds or to the hatchery. And so these are the, the issues that we have. I mean, we're advocating over and over and over. Put, put the tribes at the table. Put them as the co-managers. Stop micromanaging the tribes because we want to get these projects underground. Thank you. Thank you. And I think one of the other just things I wanted to highlight is that uh, this is why we are so committed to these public-private partnerships to support tribes um, at Native Americans and philanthropy. We have a new MOU with the Department of Interior to stand up an Office of Strategic Partnerships, which will be people inside Interior working in the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs office to develop relationships with philanthropy and tribes. We'd like to try to make that a permanent resource for tribes. And then organizing our philanthropic partners to make that a durable um, network work of not only funders, but those who are pushing on on um, future administrations and Congress to do this work and to get these funds out. Um, that's all our, we have time for. Please join us uh, in thanking our panel tonight. Really appreciate you joining us. And then I think, uh, oh, I, I think Lisa's going to close us out. So I want to introduce Lisa Jacuzzi, who is one of our close partners at Biodiversity Funders Group, who's going to close us out. Easy job. Do you mind if I sure, do? Yeah, All right. I don't want to stand between anybody and the rest of this wonderful party, but I do want to thank our incredible tribal leaders here tonight for joining us and telling the stories that we really have you know, just compelling stories that we all need to hear about tribal led conservation. Um, I also want to thank Native Americans and Philanthropy for your partnership and especially to Eric Stegman for all of his leadership in this work. Um, a big thank you to Center for American Progress for organizing this event, this wonderful evening of celebration. Um, so Biodiversity Funders Group has been honored to work with these great organizations because we really believe that addressing one of the greatest challenges of our time, climate change, begins with honoring the knowledge and leadership of tribes across the United States. It's been heartening to see this administration, um, you know, the recognition of this unprecedented support of tribal conservation across the country, right? We seem to get an announcement once a week about some new initiative, um, and especially through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So we're celebrating that here tonight, and as well as the, the federal agencies who really made a commitment to these programs. Um, and just last week, I think we may have touched on this earlier, but the administration's um, announcement of funding of $25 million, which is just to start, um, for bison restoration as part of a $2 billion investment in restoring U.S. lands and waterways. So that's, that's also another big thing to celebrate tonight. Um, so this effort will be grounded in the leadership and long-standing knowledge of tribes like the Sachangu, who we're honored to have with us tonight as well. Um, but private philanthropy also has a vital role to play in funding conservation strategies and the priorities of the or, uh, for the original stewards of our environment, especially land managers across the U.S. So um, we saw the power of the matching funds um, and the National Fish and Wildlife Project's uh, that we heard a few minutes ago. So we know how private philanthropy can really provide leverage for this work. So I'm excited for Biodiversity Funders Group, uh, our membership funding these efforts through the relationships with NAP and um, the Biden administration and Center for American Progress. So I'm thrilled that we're here tonight to celebrate and I wanna thank you all for coming and, and I think I'm allowed to say, enjoy the rest of the celebration here tonight. So thank you. <laughs>